So I'm Victoria Rodriguez Roldan. I am, my day job is a senior policy manager at AIDS United, where we work to end the HIV epidemic. And I would say I'm a disability advocate at heart because of my own mental health disabilities. Uh, and I bring that throughout my entire life to try to push the disability world into one that is inclusive of all mental health and developmental disabilities, not just the photogenic disabilities. So I was a year old when the ADA passed. I am 31 years old and we're celebrating the 30th anniversary. So I have no memory, I grew up with it. My first memory of the ADA was my mother who was diabetic getting uh, talking about accommodations at her work to store insulin in her in the work fridge uh, along those lines and I remember her talking about this new thing called the ADA you know how people talk about work at home uh, but the ADA I had I would say I had my own mental conception of what is uh, a disabled person um, until I myself was dealing with the I feel different, both because of my being trans, because of my mental health, and eventually dealing with it and getting treatment when I was in law school, which I don't, a law school is always an interesting experience in and of itself. It's a three-year hazing ritual. But I would say one of the things that motivate me into disability is seeing just how much in disability, we often treat people as either poor things of pity or as scary and need to be locked away, basically. Often with physical disabilities, it's the object of pity. With mental health disabilities, it's the uh, scary, let's lock them away. Why are they allowing those people out in the community? And having seen that, having been scared of it, having been worried about my career if I were out, uh, it, which says a lot as a trans person being worried about being out as uh, someone with a mental health disability. I don't think, I mean, I think we need to fundamentally alter how society sees what is normal and not normal uh, and how that works as far as inclusive, being inclusive of all disabilities. I would say that one of the things that impacted me the most was, for example, when I got out of law school. In law school, I received accommodations right as I was about to graduate and help from the assistant dean of students, Sherry Abbott at the time, um, because I was pretty much experiencing a lot of problems that are related to my disability. And that probably wouldn't have been possible without the ADA, without the spirit of it. And later, when I started my career, uh, a few months later, actually, I joined as a Schedule A hire in the U.S. Department of Labor. If it weren't for the initiative of the federal government that was partially inspired by the ADA to uh, make sure that people with disabilities are hired by the federal government, then maybe I wouldn't have started in civil rights in DC uh, when I did. Um, so it has made a difference for me in receiving accommodations at the jobs I've had and so forth. So it is a question of how do we, we already have a whole generation like myself who are in our early 30s and our 20s, all the millennials and Zoomers that don't remember the dark days before the ADA, but we can't just coast on the, yay, we did the ADA, now let's all go home and party, because there is so much more work to be done, basically. Like, people with disabilities are still routinely having to fight for their rights under the ADA to be solved. If we went around D.C., uh, spotting architectural barriers, we could spot a dozen in a single mile radius. Uh, and that is a problem. 
And this is especially true, I like to call talk about the sexy versus the non-sexy disabilities. When we talk about disability, people often get this inspiration for a mental image of the photogenic person in a wheelchair, extra bonus point if they're straight and white, uh, but don't want to talk and exclude from the picture, from that pretty group picture, the person who stutters, the person who uh, has chronic pain and can't work because of him, uh, the person with mental health disabilities who has had psychosis or other experiences like that. And even when we talk about mental health, we try and end the stigma and other such calls for action. We often focus on the idea of um, let's talk about the people who were depressed and took some Prozac and got better, but don't want to talk about people who are in long-term institutions, about people who experience psychosis, about people who experience bipolar disorder, and so forth. And we need to be clear that it's all disabled people that matter, basically, at the risk of sounding all lives matter-ish, not just those we like the most. I would say fundamentally, there needs to be a change in how federal law treats people with mental health disabilities. We need to fundamentally end institutionalization. We need uh, to include health, universal health coverage because people shouldn't be relying on having a job to have access to affordable health care. And I am also thinking as a major change the fundamental idea that people with mental health and developmental disabilities have rights in general. I like to tell people use your privilege, kind of like how they put the signs on the metro and the New York subway uh, that say, if you see something, say something. Well, it applies here. If you see something aimless, say it. Don't let, don't wait till someone with a disability was exhausted of having to fight for themselves has to say it. And when people bring it up, evaluate and help them, be an ally. 